Welcome back to the Inside Track. I'm Phil Coppola, and in this week's episode, I'm really excited to feature my interview with Lee Odess. Lee is a globally renowned thought leader, influencer, and is now the chief executive officer of the Access Control Executive Brief, which can be found on his website, leodesk.com. The brief provides you with a monthly breakdown of everything that's going on in the access control community. If you have any interest in subscribing, I've included a link down below. I wanted to take this opportunity with Lee to really sort of get to know him on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Who is he? Where did he come from? And how did he become so versed or so well-versed in the world of access control? And then from there, I'd like to get his take on emerging trends, new technologies, and where he sees the industry going over the next several years. Lee is also hosting a really interesting event at ISC West called The Lounge. And this is sort of a place where you can come, chill out, network with like-minded individuals, and he's going to be partnering with the likes of HID as well as a number of other manufacturers. And I'd like to get his take on how exactly he came up with this uh, really interesting idea and what folks can expect from The Lounge. So without further ado, Let's dive in. I am joined by Leo Des. Lee, thank you so much for making the time for us today. Of course. I feel like this is a long time coming, Phil. I've been it, a bit big it, fan, first time caller. Is that what you said? <laughs> it really has been. I mean, I remember. Uh, early days of COVID, I had just started the the uh, the Inside Track podcast for Genetech, and I remember you and I having a, a really good conversation, sort of wrapped around that, and you know, sort of just, I think we were both early in yeah. what what it is that we would eventually become in in the industry. Right now, you with the with the with the executive brief, and me over at HID. I think. Uh, you know, we, we both sort of recognized we were both doing maybe something right. Maybe we were doing something wrong. Who knows? Well, the history will tell, I guess. But exactly. uh, it feels good. It, it feels good so far. It certainly does. So um, obviously a lot of people know you. Uh, some people don't. Um, tell us sort of who is Leo Des? What makes you tick? And how did you get your start in the access control industry? And sort of walk us through your progression to where you are now as sort of like this preeminent voice in in the access control industry no i appreciate that and i was grateful for the opportunity to to tell a story so yeah my my career started really i would say as miles fawcett at the time was a, a security integrator that owned a company called urban alarm uh at the time my wife and i owned an audio video and lighting control company uh we did integration and uh, it was called Energy Light Control, and uh, Miles and I partnered uh, a lot on projects. Um, and after I went through and sold that company uh, and got out of that business, he introduced me to Steve Ventil over at Brevo. Uh, it happened to be in Bethesda, not a lot of manufacturers. I wanted to get back to it. I cut my teeth in the sort of the building products IoT world with Lutron early in the days, um, selling lighting controls, which actually come to it. There's a lot of similarities to that industry to, to ours. Um, so it's very, it relates inevitably uh, heavily. But yeah, so he introduced me to Steve and uh, I, I joined the company and I was there all the way through to the, the recent, or recent, but at the, at the time it was recent sale to Dean Draco uh, and his team. Um, so I, I transitioned out when that happened. Um, and then from there went to Unikey. So worked heavily globally on embedding technology into uh, traditional, I'd call it more analog uh, um, uh, products, hardware uh, throughout the world, uh, both commercial and residentially. Um, from there, I went to Allegion, uh, worked in the partnering program, something they called service provider business, which just basically meant all of our products in third party uh, ecosystem. So learned a lot about the ecosystem there. Uh -huh. Um, left there and started my own uh, consultative, and this is back when we first met, called Group 337, which uh, at least the, the idea, oh, frankly, I'll say when I first started it, the idea was I wanted to take ISC, well, this is January 2020, I wanted to take ISC West and bring it digital through utilizing YouTube and LinkedIn. So I bought a camera and a mic. Um, and then I also wanted to give more voice to startups because through those different entities that I worked at, I met a bunch of startups, but frankly, we're getting no 
airtime and couldn't afford booths. And so it was like, well, the best way I felt to do that was to do some stuff digitally online. So I recorded 75 videos with somebody. And then, you know, we all saw what happened next in March and <laughs> with the pandemic. And this, yep. you know, though, I had, you know, 75 videos that I flooded, uh, frankly, uh, the LinkedIn with uh, and focused heavily on LinkedIn. And then also I would say was it's kind of I just started wanting to write more than anything else. And it was really about my thoughts and views of where the industry was going. Uh, and I was I would call him like a frustrated writer because I didn't know how else to express it other than screaming into the, uh, you know, the window here. I, I just started writing and created a newsletter. Ended up working with, call it 50 to 60 companies that liked what we wrote. I wrote a book called The Six Phase Changes Shaping Access Control. Uh, that company was purchased uh, to one of our clients, Latch. Um, after they went public, uh, you could read about what went on for the next 10 months. Uh, while I was at Latch, I ended up deciding to leave and then starting the Access Control Executive Brief, which I would say is the nice thing is over the 10 months of me being gone from doing what I was doing, market shifted a bit more. A lot of what we're talking about is truth. I continued to build a reputation and, and I would say uh, a voice. But I, coming through it, I think what I learned from all the other companies that I started with my wife and over the years is that they always had an intention to be started one way and then gravitated somewhere else. Like Group 337 was turning into, I would say, a large consulting company for basically anything and everything. I wanted to just take over, really, frankly. And I lost track of really what I wanted to be. Energy Light Control was supposed to be early focused on green technology. Ended up doing AV, which is like, you know, because people paid me. Um, was really the only reason. So I spent a lot of time focused on my values uh, and what was driving me and, and simplifying things. And I wanted to focus on the access control and smart lock community. That's it. And I wanted to get back to writing, but I was going to paywall at this time, which I did because I found um, initially at first when I did group 237, I don't know, some people knew me, but not a lot. Uh, coming this time, more people knew about me and I wanted to have a more meaningful engagement where I could write and, and frankly monetize it so that I could spend the time to go do that, frankly, versus chasing consultative engagements because, you know, I needed to bring money in. Sure. Um, so I yeah, created the brief, it's supposed to be once a month. Now it's like twice a month, created a Slack group and community because I find that an area that I spend a lot of time and I feel is needed is building community. Um, and then now I'm also going out and because we have in real life now, um, going to events, uh, procuring space, and putting on uh, storytelling with partnerships with companies or on my own, whatever it may be. So doing one at Cretech, uh, we're creating uh, the Access Control Village. We're going to MIPIM and doing a breakfast at the real estate show in France. Um, ISC West, we were doing the lounge. So uh, trying to create different textures and really have a voice about the industry where it's going from today to tomorrow. Yeah, so that's think, a quick on who I am. Yeah, that... that that's great. That's really great. I mean, I think that the the industry in general. So, like, if we if we segment the physical security industry, and you know, you know, you take like video surveillance and and kind of put that in one bucket, and I would you know lump in video management systems and whatnot into that side, and then the access control side. I feel like there are so few voices, independent voices, that really truly understand the access control business uh than there are on the video surveillance and vms side like i feel like that might be almost oversaturated you got a lot of voice over there and not so much on the access control side because i feel like with access control it's it's a little bit more complicated than yeah. uh, than a camera is i think it's complicated but i also think we've just allowed the manufacturers to drive most of the conversation and it's yeah heavily product it's heavily focused on the integrator channel side of things. Um, and frankly, we haven't necessarily, the most advertising and marketing we did was, you know, big shows and use cases, like right. white papers, like, and the, the idea and the concepts around, I mean, what's interesting to me is that if you really are looking at a lot of these companies, they don't even have a chief marketing officer. Um, you have a lot of product marketing people, which do a very nice job, but it, we need to go beyond cut sheets. And 
I also think that we've, I, I, I jokingly say this, but I think it's true. I, I think as an industry, we've bored people to death for the past 30 years <laughs> with the concept and idea that, you know, as part of what I, one of the things I'm working on is documenting the history of electronic access control. And as I do that, I come to find out that like the messages haven't changed since 1973, the haircuts and clothes do, but messaging doesn't. And we've, we've, what's been a feature of like, Hey, don't worry about it. We'll take care of it because you don't want anyone to get shot or killed here and take on the risk just leave us alone. We're isolated. You know, the more integrated we are with other things outside of our industry, the, the bigger our, our attack surface is. So like, let's not, so what has been historically a feature is now a bug as just like everything else, when digital transformation happens, it's not just a technical thing, but the business changes. And we're now seeing that and we're in the middle of it. So I think timing is right as well. Yeah. Um, I think that's a big part of it. Yeah. I, and it's certainly one of the things that I want to talk to you about today, because I do feel like the security industry in and of itself is sort of going through this paradigm shift more towards digital digitalization, right? The digital transformation of what a physical security system should be and what the end user actually wants to get out of it. It's no longer... Video surveillance is in a box. Access control is in a box. The intrusion detection system is in a box. And maybe we can get some of this stuff to work together. I think as traditional security folks, we would say, yeah, and we'll get a platform that, you know, we'll, we'll tie all these things together. Whereas what the end user is looking for is, hey, these are all endpoints. That camera can do something. The access control system can do something. The intrusion detection system can do something for me that I can use as part of a much broader um, uh, use case inside of my facility. And we're seeing that now just happen to take off. And, and you know, do you think the traditional security industry is ready for that transformation? So uh, I think a couple of things. Um, so I believe, I agree, uh, there's a paradigm shift. I've been calling it a phase change of going from water, which is historically the high security, Omnia defined $10 billion marketplace that we take things that guard airports and bring them down through local hair salons. Um, and we use the same channels, the same messaging, the same products, it doesn't matter, we build horizontally. Um, and our main pro job, number one, is to keep bad people out and do locking and unlocking. We do that better than anybody. That still is true. I think what has happened now is, like you're saying, is the the, the phase change of going from water to ice, that middle period uh, of slush is where we're currently at now. And I believe the ice in the end is a marketplace that looks a lot similar to what we have now, but is even greater and bigger. And it, it's about the value that our industry can deliver, if not our industry, somebody will, uh, around keeping people out and keeping people safe but then what else can it do and i think that's been the biggest thing that when you see a digital transformation is the exponential side of what has traditionally been what it is um let's say like i don't know you could maybe look at movies and then they move to streaming and like i, I don't know like I, I haven't spent enough time looking at those analogies but i think you you, you look at it, it, i guess cars in some ways with like uber coming in and turning everybody's car into a taxi right my utility was getting my kids to, to their sporting events. Now that same car could be used as a vehicle for, you know, delivering pho to somebody's <laughs> house. It's like different utilization, different utility, different values. So when I look at a car, I'm not just purchasing to get my kid to camp into the park. I'm also looking at it as a revenue source to pay for vacations. I don't right, know. Like right. it, it, yeah. It's a, it's, a, it's a utility change. For and sure. I believe that is happening in our industry. And the biggest change is, the introduction, uh, you know, this is where we talk about convergence being our, our industry and IT. I actually think it's the convergence of our industry into enterprise software. And that's an even bigger one. It's just, it's not as obvious. And it also threatens a lot of the institutions in our industry. So we want to have a binary conversation where I'm trying to say is we have an or conversation. I just think the or is much bigger. It's called mainstream markets. And in the expectation of how our systems will work fundamentally change. They still have the core. And that's why I believe people are like, why are you even spending your time worrying about it in access control? It's because I actually believe those with two feet strongly into security 
will win long term with a value proposition than say ordering lattes intended experience trying to do security i think it's better to go from security that way we just have to do it right and you know i i think the biggest challenge right now that our industry is facing is that so many manufacturers and systems integrators are used to the traditional way of doing business whereas the end user is sort of looking for th this new sort of technology paradigm where we can take aspects of a and b and apply them to c so for example uh, in the commercial real estate world you've got these big high rises all over the world that now uh, want to start enticing people to obviously come back to the office and and you know more and more folks are doing that but how are they doing that is by empowering the employees and empowering the the folks that work in that building through you know really unique uses of their own application right so they, there's an app for the building and that app allows me to book conference rooms and book time in the gym and order food on my phone and have it delivered to my desk oh and by the way it also has my access control credential built into it and oh by the way i can see the video surveillance camera from from the main lobby or the the cameras that are in the gym to see you know how many people are in the gym so it's like we're taking all these individual components that we've siloed for 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 all these years and now the end user is saying well i want to put them all together under this one really unique app and i i see that change happening most rapidly in commercial real estate but i'm sure there's other other parts of the world where that's going to be adopted as well yeah so uh the verticals that i'm seeing so there's a couple things there and, and I'll, I'll try to touch on them but the first part is uh you're seeing it it already happened in hospitality yeah right? oh so yeah yeah if, any, in, if you're yeah, going like, to a marriott or or wherever and you're using your phone to get into your door that that's what we're that's really what we're talking about here correct and, and then you see it in multifamily and then commercial real estate the enterprise so you know companies that are inside those real estate big buildings and that as well and then the the last one that i believe is going to have this is life sciences because of sort of the a lot of a lot of reasons why but i think what you're seeing more than anything else is a couple things a the introduction of enterprise software has created this need for verticalization to happen in those areas to where before you know a lot of our systems we didn't have to have even the the verbs and nouns of the people on the end because it was sort of like person or card and we didn't have to worry about them because our relationship with them was the given card and identity that we gave to them that they could use. So frankly, we didn't have to speak to them or even have them recognized within our system. They were stick figures. They weren't people with meat on the bones and, and, that, and, and that. So now we have to have that because we have an interaction with them. And that's the impact of mobile computing. We like to talk about mobile as mobile credentials. I think that's a byproduct of a mobile computing. Agreed. Like, we talk about it because it's an iteration of an existing system that we already have. So we're we're trying to relate it to things that we know. That if we started in, in talking to a lot of startups that come from outside our space, they don't talk about mobile credentialing. They talk about mobile computing and they talk about cloud computing because these are fundamental architectures right. of how you design a system. But we we haven't figured that out yet, really. So we're we're starting to, and and it's frankly you're being dragged into it by by a lot of cases. Well, I mean, so, and I feel like the security industry is is like that in general. Like if you remember the switch from analog to IP, folks had to be dragged into it. And there were a lot of companies that kind of got left by the wayside, those who didn't want to uh, yeah. to to take part in the in the transformation to IP. And I feel like now we're seeing another one of those shifts where you're going to have to be some folks are going to have to be dragged kicking and screaming into the into the new world. Or just left. And I think it's fine because, again, this isn't an and an or. The difference I would say between that and this is that we were still working within the defined $10 billion or whatever billion dollar high security market. So you had disruption where people fell behind. Yes, that will happen here. But the difference being here is that a new market has opened, which is very different. So I still think we will continue to have these $10 billion market player, dominant players in the space. There will be some that will cross into and maybe do both or totally shift over into this new market. It doesn't mean one's bad or good. It's just, right. it's, just it's who do you want to be and and how do you want to go to market? So it, it's I'll give you a good example. It's like 
take any of the large, well-known access control systems that have been in the market, or some of even the, the mid ones that have been around for a long time that have been floating around, you know, three to six million a year, even upwards of like, you know, we've had great past 10 years. So they're all are high fiving. There's 8% growth, 12% growth. Why would, if I'm a manager, and this is where I think what we're lacking is nothing technically, we lack leadership uh, and creativity and curiosity as an industry. Because if I've been working there for a while and we've been seeing this growth, my investor base, if I'm a if I'm a, a public company or even a private company, everyone's high. I'm getting my bonuses. I'm excited. We're doing great. Why would I change? Right. Right. So that to me drives more of this than anything else. It's like it's the devil I know versus the devil I don't know. We're an industry of managers, not leaders, frankly, and we're a, uh, an industry that has been again a, a a feature has always been that we know the devil we know better than anybody. And where we haven't been a uh, an industry that has taken on a lot of risk over the years, to where this is risky. Like I see it now, and I have conversations with companies that are like, "Man, we're spending so much money on cloud," and like, how do I rationalize that? I'm like, because it's the inevitable long term of your organization depends on it. So, but I find that a lot of those people that are making those decisions probably won't be around when the fruits of that are done. So they're having to make decisions today that will more or less be to benefit people that are before like, or, or down the road. And, and frankly, that's a little scary because if I don't meet my numbers today, I'm not going to get my bonus. I can't buy a boat, can't take my family on vacations. <laughs> like, yes, that, like, there's, yeah. there's an incentivization, if 100%. that's a word, problem. And, uh, you know, I, I, will, I will give HID a lot of kudos here. Now, obviously, listen, disclaimer, 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 I work for HID, but they are investing a tremendous amount of resources into mobile, right? And and taking that business ostensibly away from the traditional physical card, right? I mean, these guys are printing millions of plastic cards every year, and they don't want you to buy them anymore. They want to shift that to the credential on the phone. Now, that, that, just like what we said, there there's a lot of advantages to moving the credential to the phone, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more. But to your point, some of the industry lacks uh, some of this leadership, and the incentivization problem is there. And now you don't you're not making decisions sort of for the future. You're making decisions for today that will ultimately impact the future. Which could lead to eventually the, you know, a, a decline for for the traditional players. Yeah. So I'll, I'll give credit where credits due. So this is why when people ask me who am I, first of all, nothing ever happens fast enough for me in that regard. So <laughs> True. Like, so I, and that's more of a me problem than anybody else problem. But um, I'll give credit to Bjorn, the, the CEO. So this is leadership on that end, right? I'll give credit to like this is where like I'll take another company I said like Linnell. People wonder why like Linnell is too wide. Well, because I've met Kumar, who is new into it with new ideas. So I, I'm I'm encouraged by uh, what he's doing on that end and the opportunity that it presents itself. And it's not just that it needs to be new people. I don't think so. Like I actually think it's got to do with new ideas, new thoughts, an appetite to have a conversation, to be curious about it, not to sort of just defend the what we've known yesterday to the point that because this is a case of when not if and a lot of these things and i'm and i am uh, I, this is usually the next sort of thing i always hear from people it's like i don't have an appreciation for the current business i know i do and i but i believe that we can walk and chew gum at the same time and i believe it's a choice every single day because frankly i've worked for organizations and have worked enough with them to know that we hold on to yesterday, yesterday's yesterday technology because we're making such good margins on it and our dealer network loves it and we don't like to sunset things and like and it's hard because again if I'm a product line manager whose incentives are set up to continue to grow three to eight to twelve percent I've got this thing it's known I know if I just continue doing for at least the inevitable time maybe I'm gonna game it that like. I'm only going to be here for the next five years anyway, so it doesn't matter. Like, like I do all of those things. It's hard to make those decisions. I, I, I don't envy it. But well, I, I mean, I if do you look, those who do it will win. Yeah, if, if I mean, everybody. I feel like this example is used far too often. But look at 
Kodak, right? Kodak made these same types of decisions around their film business. They could, Kodak invented the digital camera. Not a lot of people know that. And they canned it because it was going to cannibalize their film business. And inevitably, everybody else came out with a digital camera and completely killed film. And where is Kodak today? They're, ostensibly, they're gone. And to your point about Linnell, I, I've, I've seen what Linnell is looking at doing in terms of like carriers and organization, putting all these, like getting their, um, I don't want to say getting their act together because their act has been together for a long time, but sort of strategizing on how we're going to take all these different individual business units and make them one and really have a cohesive strategy. I think that's really smart. Um, and it shows, to your point, executive leadership that doesn't want to be Kodak, uh, you know, if, if we can coin that term. Made it a verb. Nice. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, so speaking of changes and uh and trends uh so i have on my on my list of things that i want to talk to you about like emerging technologies and again disclaimer the hid thing right i think mobile credentials is is an emerging technology it's been around like with hid since 14 so it's it's been around for some time but i feel like now the adoption is is finally starting to take off and and you've got a lot of people talking about it whether it's hid or some of our competitors uh I also feel like there is a fight for the credential. You've got your traditional players that are still, you know, pushing the the physical cards, but mobile, facial recognition. You know, the the folks like uh, Alcatraz and and several others are really sort of coming into the fight and and pushing the credential to to a whole new realm. And then, of course, you still have OSDP. Um, what do you think? What what are like the emerging technologies that that are coming to the forefront now? Yeah, so I, I like to, so if I take the first one you said, mobile credentials, I mean, it's to me, it's great, but we've already missed sort of the wind. Like, we should be talking about the value it creates beyond the credential. I think, again, we use the credential because, frankly, for a lot of people, yeah, you've been wanting it to happen. Finally, Apple, this is sort of the impacts of, of big tech and uh, into the industry. Apple's now opening up NFC, so now... There's a, a richer conversation that could be had around that because, frankly, mobile has been around for quite a while yep. on that end. I think also there, there's uh, – oh, so, so yeah. So I would focus heavily now on – it's going to quickly shift to the differentiation of what you can do with it versus the credential itself. And, again, it's an area that I believe we can own if we want to. Um, what happens is now, if you notice – there's been a lot of people that have been trying to do this for a while that come from, say, tenant experience in the commercial real estate marketplace that ultimately fundamentally come back to access control because it's the thing that gets people to utilize the app on a regular basis right. is getting into the building. So they have to come back to us. So it's sort of like, why don't we command the space that we occupy and start to lean more into that and say, all right, let, let's play if we want to go do that versus it happening to us. We saw it happen to us with delivery, frankly. Our industry didn't participate enough in the development of people getting things into the building that weren't just people, but stuff that, you know, this is the e-commerce impact of our industry. We, we were asleep on that, frankly, uh, and it was done to us and now we're having to deal with it and that's fine. I would also say COVID forced a real conversation about visitor management to us than we had. Visitor, visitor management now has turned into really a digital interface of what has been an analog industry, we've used visitor management mainly for compliance or cool factor. Now it's being used as operational efficiencies, revenue generation, and really being a user experience tool to make buildings and places and whatever you use it at come alive that we've historically have had. And we've been like, it's been this thing like in the box here <laughs> that we've had for a while that we're like, ah, don't worry about this thing. Um, let me tell you what I've known for a long time and we'll take care of it from there. So yeah complete hot mess on our end of that. Now, though, my hope is, and what I'm imploring our industry to do, is to hurry up, everybody get it, so that we can move on, just like we have from cloud. Like, you're not going to see a lot of cloud computing messages inside of ISC West, for instance. You're going to see the things that cloud allows to happen, right? Like multi-tenant. Uh, you're going to see a lot of around firmware updates, of course, which is like the literally the most boring things we can talk about, but critical, I get it. 
but it's now we got to move to it. So that's my that's my mobile story. I, the biggest trend. Sorry, go. I, I just to put a, put yeah. a finer uh, one one final point on that, and this has been my frustration thus far in in joining HID and and becoming the mobile evangelist, as it were, is that the conversations that I'm having with some folks that are resistant to change. Um, you know, we could have a whole conversation probably about like cognitive biases <laughs> in our industry. Um, but like there is this, there's this fierce resistance from a big block of folks that are just so used to selling a credential or using a physical credential that they, my challenge is getting them to understand that it's not about moving the credential to the phone. It's what that then enables, right? I mean, the the most basic version of this that, that I've been able to successfully uh, message is, hey, what happens if you lose your credential versus, hey, what happens if you lose your phone? And those are two completely different scenarios, right? If I lose my credential, when did I find out that I lost it? How long did it take me to to figure that out? Where did I lose it? Is it a threat? And then how long does it take me to report? And then how long does it take for that card to be decommissioned and, and removed from the system versus, oh, crap, I just lost my phone, right? It's it's yeah. instant. And that's like... So, so you know you're going to... Soon you're going to then have to fight the, you know, oh, I'm losing my phone, but I haven't lost my face from the, you yeah. know, not to get to the facial <laughs> authentication side, but that's like... That's the next everyone, the biometrics people are going to start to feel empowered. Yes, 100%. And, and it's gonna, they're going to try to go fight the credential. When again, I, I just, to me, all of these conversations don't, I don't think it's a an and conversation, a binary. Like, I, I actually don't think we need to have conversations around, I mean, it's nice to have them, but or like, I don't think the value prop is, I lose my cards, now you won't lose your phone. Like, I I, I get it. It's, it's, it's sort of like, the safe bridge from yes. where we've been. That, and that's so where I'm where, trying to lead people. I'm trying to take people across that bridge so you yeah, can I see the bigger the bigger picture on the other side. Sure. So my, my take is, this is one of my frustrations I have with uh, new people that come into our industry, is we seem to want to take all this new and disruptive stuff and then we shove it all through the same channels of yesterday through a meat grinder and wonder why you know it comes out different on the back. But no, it actually is coming out the exact same way you're shoving it through the meat grinder versus doing things that is like transformative, which would be, I don't know, maybe you figure out who the people are in that group that don't need to be convinced and beat over the head that this is a thing. Bring those along, leave the people that aren't to go continue to do the $10 billion business that we currently have and do a good job with it. Go find new dealers and new channels along with the ones in that channel that can can cross over into the bridge. And let's go after that $70 billion market that exists. For some reason, though, we're so focused on the $10 billion market that we have to transition that. I don't care about that because I also ultimately think what will happen here is I do believe it will eat it. The mainstream will come and eat it because that $70 billion is going to taste so good. It's going to be so big that we'll start to see investment dollars going over to that capture market because I don't have to. It's just it's going to be different dollars, frankly, and it's going to look different that I'm sure the 10 will still be there. And again, this comes down to when I don't know. But I, if it's me, I'm figuring out how to go be like, cool, no problem. Like you guys can hang out, keep doing what you're doing. I'm going to go over here and we're going to go grow this market and go invest in it. That, that would be my suggestion to go do and have messaging, frankly, that fits the new versus the old. I'm sure you got to have some message, but I would, I would, I would look at the e equalizing the amount of investment you're making in trying to, you know, change the old mindsets. Yeah. That, nice. Yeah. That, that's a good, good point. I, I will certainly take that advice for sure. <laughs> you uh, should do it. Don't get me wrong. You oh yeah. Do it. The, at some point they all come, but we over arc in the old. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're right. You're absolutely right. You were going to mention uh, the the biggest emerging technology before I. Uh... The biggest emerging technology is actually not a technology, in my opinion. It's the introduction of a new stakeholder being the end user, and the end user being a stakeholder now means that we have to actually be really good at user experience, and we actually have to think about that. We actually have to do it. We can't just have our 
our developers develop applications. And I actually think it matters. Like I, right now I'm a little, like I see some companies that are trying to drive this message. You look at their apps, you're like, you gotta be kidding me. It looks like Craigslist <laughs> developed your application. Yeah. It's because historically you haven't had to worry about that. Cause if I had a dollar worth of development time to spend on bluer, blinkier lights and more hinges and panels versus doubling down on the user experience application, where if I looked at the metrics, show that two people are using my app right now. So why would I spend money like doing that when I've got thousands of dealers screaming at me that I need a blue blinkier light? So I'll spend the dollars on the blue blinkier light. But the problem is, is now is as our tools get brought more into the space, we're now going to have an extremely large group of people that are going to be very vocal. And I can tell you this, I fundamentally believe what's going to shift is what's going to happen is access control systems installed, existing, new, whatever. They are going to be brought into the conversation with the HR department, whoever's in charge of employee engagement, especially as we talk about returning to the office or commercial real estate people. I'm seeing it currently right now sure. that have transitioned from, we don't, they don't build offices anymore. They're in the hospitality business at this point. So if that system, which if you think about this, right? Before, if I had a card and it worked and I came up to the building, but it didn't work at that point, we were like, cool, it defaulted to not letting you in. So it was like, it was okay, right? Because it was a security thing. Somebody called somebody, the person came and said, sorry, here, here's another card, whatever. Now, I believe if I come to the office two days a week, three days a week, one day, what do you pick the number? And I show up and it doesn't know who I am. It doesn't welcome me. And I don't have a good experience. When I get my survey that they're using through Salesforce or whatever application to see how am I doing, they're like, you know what? Every time I come to this place that you want me to come to, it's a pain in the ass. I spend 20 minutes waiting for me to even just get access into the door. I'm not coming to the office anymore. You're telling me that's not going to fundamentally go up to where the, all of a sudden people are going to be like, show me this app. Right. And you're going to show it to them. And it's just like Craigslist made it. They're going to be like, well, no, <laughs> hey, this sucks. Like, so that's just one example, I think, of a downstream of how we will start to see impacts of change happening. You saw it in hospitality. It's why every hot hotel you go into has a lock at the door. I mean, at the uh, at the desk to show people how to use the app. It's because fundamentally the user experience is new. It's different. It sucks. I could tell you I'm already seeing now companies that understand that are engaging with legacy companies. You got new people coming involved and it's all driven around the user experience side of this. That's it. I mean, it used to be like if you look at hospitality, there was a difference between, you know, going to a Hojo's and going to a Four Seasons. And when you went to the Four Seasons, you expected a certain level of service. And I feel like there is that same analogy to be made for the the digital user experience in hospitality. I want to be able to go to a hotel, use my phone to unlock the door and maybe order room service, order a, you know, a movie on, on the TV, be given directions to the gym, you know, all that sort of stuff. And I don't want to say it's like to avoid having to deal with people, uh, hotel staff and, and whatnot, because I'm sure they all do a fantastic job. But at the same time, I want that experience. It, it makes it feel like if I'm paying for a Four Seasons or a Marriott or whatever, that I'm getting this experience that's a little bit better than. And to your point about commercial real estate, I feel like it's the same exact story. I could go work in this building, which has, you know, amenities from the 1990s, or I could go and work in this building for this company that's got this really bespoke app that recognizes who I am. I walk right through the door. It uses my phone as the credential. It, it signals the elevator. The elevator comes down and gets me. It brings me upstairs. And then when I want to order food, I go to the same. So like there's this whole um, user experience tied into the apps uh, and, and the mobile experience that I feel like is really in demand at the end user level. Right. And, and and they're the ones that are going to be dragging the industry into it. Yeah, I think that it's that. I, I believe there's, you know, if I would even trickle it down into the introduction of enterprise software into the way our systems are configured and set up, like, so the, the user experience with the with the uh, channel itself is on that end. So so if I continue on to the, uh, another trend, and in, in if you would, is, there's an introduction into a new channel that I believe we've not had in our industry, or we had, but we've always treated them a little bit different. And that is the introductions of systems integrators 
and the ISVs, uh, uh, independent software vendors, that we're seeing creep into our industry now creep loud and clear, especially in vertical solutions. So I think it's a an evolution of what we saw with PSIMs, um, but that was very inside baseball and, and fundamentally, um, uh, I wouldn't call it a success, I'd call it okay, um, of value creation. But now what you're starting to see is these companies that are middleware companies, and, I, and they've been around again, if you historically, if you wanted to get a lock integrated into an access control system, they would either do it themselves or they would hire a third party company um, to come out. Guys like Jonathan Lowry, Silver Pine. I mean, there's a long list of, of uh, Z9s of the world and people that would come in and, you know, one company would either, either they would combine and pay them to go do it or they'd make it part of the project cost to go do it. But you, would, you had a guy, a team, typically a guy. Um, <laughs> going in and writing all of that to make it work together. So now what's happened is enterprise software has come into our industry and you're starting to see these middleware companies and these SI systems integrators. Historically, the platforms of our industry have been access control systems. Everything kind of funneled through those to the security integrator, to the, to the, to the end uh, customer. Now access control is part of a larger value proposition, HR departments, IWMS, so workplace management systems, um, uh, engagement applications, tenant engagement applications, whatever. Access control is still there. Still, there's that part underneath it, right, of all the integration into it. But now my access control platform is part of a larger platform that is being brought together by software integrators, SI system integrators, that have historically been people like Capgemini and Wipro and Accenture and Deloitte and Fujitsu and a million smaller companies like Aperio and a lot of them, but they've been, they've been around. Actually, we've even had some in our industry for before, Traction On Demand, which created Traction Guest, which is a visitor management system, one of the largest Salesforce integrators that was actually purchased by them and, and Traction On uh, Guest was sold off to a, 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 a PE firm, whatever, long story. Um, but it's an example of, of what, what has existed. So now you're seeing the solo insights of the world. You're starting to see uh, the Stratosoft of the world. You're starting to see, uh, I mean, I can list, there's like a name of them. Uh, Swift Connect uh, is there. And also Tracerdo, so Jonathan Lowry is now a company. Braxos, like all these companies that have been here or are, are, uh, are new into our industry, it's a channel that sells and integrates software that has nothing to do with hardware, although they can work with it, but that's the difference. And I believe they're an enablers of software solutions. They help us go fast. They help the customers go fast because they're able to say yes to things where historically we've said no to things. And they're just more aware when it comes to the overall landscape of what is out there from a platforming standpoint that can interact with what we have. And that's inevitably here. I've seen posts of people that work for Salesforce or are creating. We saw this happen in the gyms. Like mind body has been around for quite a while. Like that is a, a classic example in my case. There's been integrators and people that have done that on that side. It's now getting into commercial real estate and other areas. And I believe we'll see it even bigger uh, into other verticals. Yeah, when when you take a look at those types of systems integrators, as as, as you call them, and I think you're rightly so, um, they're the ones that when we talk about a bespoke app for a commercial real estate building, they're the ones that are building it, right? So they're the ones that are taking all these yep. individual, the building management system, the elevator control, the, the escalator control, the access control system, the human resources database, and they're taking this giant, uh, hub and spoke approach and saying, okay, I'm going to be this thing that ties them all together and then gives you this really unique experience. The question yep. is, should the traditional systems integration channel, the, the security systems integrator, be concerned about their move into this space? Um, I, I think yes, if you don't do anything, uh, but also no, because I believe there's it depends on who you want to be. <laughs> I, I believe like high security, again, will be around. So you can be the best on that. Like There's a lot of government work. There's a lot of enterprises that haven't crossed into this too. So there's a, there's a large customer set that 
everything I'm saying, you can give me four examples of how it's not true. I'll give you four that are, and it doesn't mean that I'm wrong and you're wrong or I'm right and you're right. It just means that they both exist. Right. Like it's, it's allowed to be, we, we can have multiple things that are, you know, in conflict, but still exist on that side. So my opinion is it's an opportunity more than anything else for you to define who the business is that you want to be for today and tomorrow. And I believe it's an, an opportunity uh, if you take it. I do. I would be concerned if you're going into some of these verticals or have been in these verticals and you have an introduction of a lot of these entities, because I do believe you'll start to see a value arbitrage happen and you're starting to see it now. Case in point, I've, I've seen and have engaged with enough commercial real estate developers that are taking their traditional access control system and turning them to one card, one user. And then they're layering on these systems that become the access control interface. Oh, interesting. So they're not ripping it out. They're just really turning that system into break fix. And then they're investing resources and energy into the areas that are making them more modern on that side. So, but if you were to ask those traditional access control systems, say, we're not losing any jobs. They didn't rip our stuff out. It's like, okay, but they've minimized you to what is called a commodity. So what's worse? Right. I don't right. know if it's worse to be ripped and replaced or if it's to be a commodity where you're just going to sit there and it's just break fix at that point. I think that's worse, personally. Yeah, agreed. And I would say, like, the traditional systems integration channel, to your earlier point, there's a huge $10 billion business to go after. There's this much larger $70 billion business to go after. And if, if it were me, I'd want to learn more about the solo insights of the world, the swift connects of the world, the genias of the world, and how I can work sort of in concert with them because they are not access control experts. They are not physical security experts. They're software experts. They're going to figure out a way to make the end user experience as good as possible. Well, at the same time, you still need readers on readers on the walls, right? And and cameras on, on the ceilings. So there, there's still definitely a, a place. It's just what that looks like five or 10 years from now is going to be very interesting. So on Jania, who you mentioned, I find them super interesting, and here's why. So if I was to look at them, I believe they're an example of a company that is moving in from a software standpoint, enterprise software, into the smart building side of things, where they're going after utilities such as uh, HVAC, and they're going after... Uh, security as a utility, and they're taking a very unique approach. Now, I would implore them not to take all of this new and shove it through the old. It's what concerns me about it is because I think they do see an opportunity. You do see traction today. I understand the demands of wanting to have revenue today and to and see an opportunity and go for it. So that's fine. But I believe they have an opportunity to be highly disruptive in the smart building side because of the way they're approaching from the software side of things, as well as, even more importantly, in my opinion, their business model is very different than the traditional way that we've gone to market. That, to me, is super interesting, and I think it could be hell of a lot more disruptive than trying to you know, transform the high security, security industry. Uh, but it's a good example... I would point to to what it looks like for a company to go after a vertical and be successful. Yeah, no doubt. So how's this for a segue? You're, to that point, you have partnered with uh, one of these systems integration technology providers called Solo Insight for the lounge at ISC. Yes. Uh, can, I'm really interested in how you came up with this idea for the lounge. So for those who don't know, years and years ago, uh, I used to work for Sony, and one of the things that I really enjoyed about going to ISC West for Sony was not the booth on the trade show floor, which was fine. It was always good because you had to meet somewhere, but Sony always did what we called the Sony Suite. So we'd have a suite in the Venetian or the Palazzo, and you'd go there, and we'd show you like all the cool stuff that, that we can't show at the booth, and that was, to me, that was the best part of the show. That's where you had the really meaningful conversations. It to me, the lounge looks like that. So uh, can you talk about sort of like the, yeah. um, the impetus, where that idea came from and, and what it is going to be in practice and how you get in via the, the yeah. whole solo insight piece? 
Yeah, no, no, I appreciate that. Yeah, so it actually, a couple years ago, we did the lounge here, smaller group. It was, uh, had a handful of sponsors in that for that. That was during Group 237. And the idea around that was, is that like, I'm not a product company. So if you look at the, at the show floor, ton of value, it has a purpose. I also think about the transition of how, uh, and you're starting to see it at, at, with you in the ISC West, with like the bridge and some of the other things that they're doing there where I give them a high five for, is you're seeing an evolution of shows needing to be activated versus before it was like a show would build a space, all the companies would come and you would have to activate it. CES was like that. Every show is frankly like that. To where now I believe you're seeing these shows and conferences to where the expectation is you're not only putting the shell on, but you're also going to activate it for me. And so I was like, all right, I'm community building. I want to show that how we can do that. So I wanted to create a space that is different. So when you walk into it, it smells different. It looks different. All the senses it's, it's, you can, you can differentiate it from what else is going on there with the idea being that I used to uh, run uh, Lutron's uh, trade show for the international builder show. And I realized that those shows were not necessarily for just then, like, you know, you work so hard at the front end of them that when the show happens, it's over, everyone high fives, like the job's done when in actuality, it just started because then you have to do all the follow up. And really what you want to do is at the show, make a memorable moment. So you could be like, Hey, remember when you saw that thing and out of everything going on, they could be like, yep, I remember your booth, your whatever, because it was cool and it was memorable. So wanting to do the same thing, Brian Karras, who I partnered with this, who people have known from the video side, he came and said, hey, I want to do something different. And I brought up that we had the lounge from before. I can't remember exactly how we did it, but we're like, yes, let's do it. Let's bring our two uh, networks together. He's more video, I'm more access control. We bring those together and we can create something in our networks and really have a, a network effect on that end. So, so yeah, so we went out, we procured um, two big meeting spaces with the idea that what we would do is go get sponsors that would like to be part of this storytelling, doing something different. We've got big round tables for meetings. We've got high tops for different meetings. And then we've got couches for more casual. Um, we've got a coffee bar in the morning that's coming. We've got happy hours each day for two uh, nonprofits in, in our space to sort of give them some opportunity of, of showcasing. And then we were giving uh, a lot of activation beforehand online, during and after. We've got these lounge talks at the top of every hour. The intent is to have a discussion moderated by a person, but it's a conversation. We purposely kept it like two or three words like ethics, with the idea being as people come and you have a conversation. Like it's just intended to be, it could be five minutes long, it can be an hour. I don't necessarily care as long as the conversation happens. I'm a firm believer that we have these micro communities amongst like, like I jokingly just said online, I'm surprised there hasn't been like single insecurity, not single insecurity. <laughs> but like, like someone hasn't done that or like, I, I always talk about like creating a group of like people that like security and like cooking. Like you can find a group and a tribe that you can participate, same thing here. So yeah, so we're bringing in a bunch of stuff. We've got a bunch of sponsors, HID is one of them. So is Solo Insight. Solo Insight is uh, working with HID to handle the process of signing up and getting access into the lounge. We're doing cards and also the digital wallets so you can come that'll be sent out hopefully this week uh and to people to where they can come in and actually experience also the technology and what we're talking about at the same time then meet the vendors that are participating the sponsors that are participating or use it as yourself as a uh a place to energize and get off the show floor and grab a coffee i don't care whatever you want to do inside the space we want to make that sort of a, a memorable space within the show and add value the best that we can. Yeah, I, I will be using it for all of the above. The The couches sound fantastic. As anybody that's ever worked an ISC West can tell you, you spend a lot of time on your feet. So the, this yeah. is a this is a fantastic idea. And as, as Lee mentioned, so where HID is partnered with Lee and with Solo Insight to provide mobile credentials through their app. So they'll basically, you will be able to get a real good flavor as to how mobile credentials work in, in the real world. So I, I would encourage anybody that hasn't already registered, uh, where would they go, Lee? Leodesk.com? Yeah, yeah Leodesk.com on the top right, there's a uh, sign up for the lounge and there's also the lounge talks. Um, you just fill it out there. And then, like I said, this week, we'll send you some information out 
to go do that. Uh, I'm grateful for the partnership, not only from HID, but then all the 13 sponsors that have uh, seen sort of the vision around what Brian and I are trying to do. And um, hopefully uh, we'll continue to, to build upon this. And I really would like to take the lounge to uh, really be a brand that there's an expectation of like, oh, what are we gonna do? And we can continue to evolve it to have different textures, different feel, they create experience. If anything, it'll be fun. Do you think you'd do it uh, for ISC East? Uh, I like to do it IC East. I like to do IFSEC. Um, you know, like I said, we're we're doing stuff at Cretec London. We're creating the Access Control Village. We're doing uh, at the security event. I'm doing the Access Control Theater. Um, so we're trying to create different things. GSX. I want to do something. Don't know exactly yet what it will look like, but yeah, the intent is to to activate uh, an experience uh, at the show. Oh, that's a fantastic idea. Well, a long time coming, indeed. Um, the access control brief. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about that. Um, obviously, you've got a passion for writing, and I understand that the uh, the goal is to get a newsletter out once a month. But I think you're probably doing a, a little bit more than that. So, yep. Yeah, so, what type of information? And again, if folks want to subscribe to the brief, leodesk.com. There's a link. Yeah. There's a link down there. I'll obviously leave links down below, but. What sort of information can folks expect to get when they subscribe? Yeah, it's a lot like what we talked about here. Uh, it's observations and synthesizing ideas. It's looking at sort of the transformation that is happening. Um, some technical, but frankly, most of it's business oriented and, and, and conceptualizing products and services that go to the market. Um, we've had everything from this new channel that we talked about discussions, um, had conversations about um, a new type of specifier that I'm seeing in the commercial real estate marketplace that really no one is targeting or going after heavily, but we're starting to see those. So a lot of the newness, it's also a global view, which uh, I don't know if we've had much of that. So I've been spending a lot of time in Europe and, and in London and um, hope to spend more time in the APAC region to really take a look at, because I'm seeing one of a trend that I'll touch on that we do talk about is the barriers of entry to go from Europe into North America for growth opportunity is unlike I've seen before in at least the times that I've been involved because um, the sort of the moat of hardware is gone. So as as the ecosystem starts to grow, this idea that I can come in through software is a lot easier than if it's historically. The same thing, though, North right. American companies going over to Europe, I'm seeing uh, on that end. So it's, it's really, we've always been somewhat of a, gl a global industry. We've always been a global industry. But it's even more because of enterprise software becoming even greater of a global industry. And one of the things that uh, you would mentioned earlier about the the brief is you have a Slack channel. So is yeah. there like an open line of, of dialogue? Yeah. So I'm actually, I mean, I put some some information in here uh, that I shared with the, the team and I'm looking at it on this side to give you an idea. Like, yeah, it's grown organically, I would say, on that end and i um, thrilled to see it. But I mean, we've had a good amount of conversations one-on-one -on -one and in large form around observations or like this morning someone was asking about texas building codes when it comes to access control and locks and and the community is helping each other that's what's you know beautiful about it um but yeah as part of signing up for that you get access to that um as well as i created that topology map i don't know if you saw it but it's got over 360 companies i put into different categories just really show the landscape of uh, the reach of our industry, um, because I don't think it's ever been put on one piece of paper. We know about these companies, but this really shows people that are either two feet in our industry or one foot in our industry uh, and, and really want to show that landscape. So tools like that to help companies. Uh, that's what I'm looking to build. Yeah, I think that's extremely helpful. And to your point, because the industry has been so manufacturer specific, these types of documents and these types of conversations just don't necessarily happen unless you're going to go out and, you know, probably hire a consultant to, to kind of do that. But then to your to your point and to the Slack channel, you, you lose sort of that uh, the ability to cross pollinate ideas from folks from all over the world. So I think that's a really unique and uh, certainly an interesting take on what's possible when when you really sort of put your mind to it. So I, I give you a lot of kudos for for pushing that forward. Um, yeah, so parting parting thoughts, parting words, where do you see the security industry in the next, let's say five and then 10 years? 
Yeah, I, I appreciate that. So I think I think a couple of things. Uh, I think in five years it'll look a lot like it looks now, but there'll be new yes. added to it, right? So I I, I don't want to. I'm not. I don't live in the binary world. I live in the uh, the additive, and I think this will be additive. So I think we'll 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 see heavy uptick on the software end that we have. I'll be interested in the next 10 years to see what happens to the lock industry itself, because that's been somewhat asleep, frankly, which it hasn't been forced. But by then, things like matter will start to impact it. Um, I think we'll start to see uh, businesses that were built with a software reoccurring that don't have to really heavily worry about the transaction of a lock one time and get a one time sale. So I think there'll be some pressures on pricing, which I think will be interesting in different business models. I really think the ecosystem and partnering side of what we do is going to look wildly different um, than it could. You're starting to see it currently now where people I can tell are starting to bulk up with each other to try to tell uh, different stories. And I think that's the bigger one, too, is I really believe uh, our industry is going to have more personality than it has before. We've been so heavy in the manufacturers and those entities are like these objects that we know by logo, but we, unless we were localized in the marketplace, we really didn't have much of a relationship with who those people were to where now, because the things like what you're doing, which I, I love, is we're starting to build personalities to brands that are built around people. This is why I believe some of the, the consumerization side and impacts of some of the social media sites and the rest of it, LinkedIn being a big one, but even more of Instagram and TikTok and the rest of it are really about the way people discover and have conversations to communicate with our brands. They're going to have to start to take a different personality other than uh, blue blinky lights. Like <laughs> I, I think it's going to be about what it does and the story built around yeah. them that I think is going to transform the way we talk about our industry, which frankly trickle down things like I really believe it maybe even brings in new talent and different types of talent into our industry because we're more approachable than some of the branding that's been done around who we are uh, perception wise. Right. It, it, how do I say this without getting into trouble uh, for working for one of those uh, established brands is, you know, people don't want to read white papers anymore. Right. I mean, some people. some people do, but it, nobody wants like the, the sanitized version of what the corporate, you know, uh, uh, marketing departments have to put out. Yeah. Um, I think one of the reasons why this type of um, interaction resonates so much is because everybody's used to seeing their regional sales manager in their office, you know, on a, on a pretty routine basis. And the, the fact is, you know, there's not so many of them and there's a whole lot of, of customers. And so you don't have the interactions maybe that, that you'd like to have as often as you'd like to and have the ability to have these kind of conversations happen in your office. So now at least we can bring some of that to the uh, to the folks that are interested in, in hearing this type of information uh, in their own time, right? So I, I, I definitely think that there's uh, there's a need and and there's a desire for this type of information it delivered in, in this type of way. So and I certainly appreciate you participating in this, and I, I extra appreciate the comment that you left on on my uh, my initial post or one of the posts that you made, sort of saying, "Hey, I'm." kind of congratulating HID for hiring me. I mean, I, I was flattered, but I understood your point for sure. Yeah, I mean, that's that's putting action behind words. Like, that's where I, I, I start to say, okay, like, you know, jokingly, not jokingly, actually, you know, if you look back at Group 237, my first article was about how our industry had a bad relationship and habit of mercury and HID. So it inevitably was not a, I would say, I've never been, just you know glowing about it but I, I would say the this is where i go back to bjorn he actually and i interacted on that instead of him getting pissed off and telling me what a piece of crap i am he actually was curious and asked questions like what why like what do you mean by that right so like that there's an engagement there and then no seeing this because i move beyond you and i would look at like benji the door dork for instance in asa abloy like there's a brand person there that is putting a, a, a name to a face and a brand that makes it far more approachable and tells stories that are interesting. I think we're going to start to see more and more and more of that. Uh, and I think it's okay. Yeah, absolutely. I, okay. I, I hope so. Uh, it's certainly more entertaining for, if for nothing yeah, else. Shit. 
it's fun. Like whatever. Heaven and forbid actually, we should have some fun. fun. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. God forbid we have fun. <laughs> well, Lee, I, I greatly appreciate your time. Uh, I've left every bit of Lee's contact information down below, including links to the brief and links to the lounge. Um, and uh, yeah, th thank you, Lee. I appreciate your thank time. You. Uh, for those who are watching this in the future, we're going to be doing another video featuring Lee all about access control best practices in the year 2023. So stay tuned for that one as well. And if it is published, click this link up here to uh to gain access to it lee thank you again have a great day and uh to the to the folks that are watching this have a great rest of your day and we'll see you on the next one